Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching Creating and Managing Service Profiles. So this is a really great lesson. It's it's part of the stuff that makes UCS UCS. You take along the you know simplified architecture and reduced infrastructure of UCS, add on the magic of service profiles, and you really get this stateless nature that UCS provides. And we're going to walk through and show you how you configure that, how you use it, and what you do. And we're going to start with what really makes a server a server. Now, if you ask most people that, they're going to tell you it's a couple little things, you know, IPs or names or something like that. But we're going to dive into why we use service profiles and what that gives us and what they contain. And we'll bring a lot of things together with service profiles. A lot of the ideas, policies, and templates that we've talked about in previous lessons kind of come back around and when we create these service profiles. Then we'll show you how to create service profiles and more importantly, how to create service profile templates because that's probably what you'll really be doing. You'll, you'll create your templates and then we'll carve off or spin off service profiles from those templates. That way your environment is the same and you get consistent deployments every time. So with that, let's go ahead and let's get started. So what really makes a server a server? It's not just, you know, the name, the IP or something like that. You know, think about what would happen if I had a server connected to fiber channel storage and I pulled the hard drives out of it, walked them over to another server, even to the same model, put those drives in, would the server boot and would it function? Most likely not. You've got a lot of things. You've got UUIDs, MAC addresses, WWNNs, WWPNs, configurations, uh, connectivity, firmware versions, firmware settings, BIOS versions, BIOS settings, all sorts of things. So it can be tough to move even you know an installed operating system from one server to another. There's a lot of pieces and a lot of parts that you have to worry about and all of these will be contained in what we call a service profile to make that easier. So the key to the stateless nature of server provisioning on UCS is the service profile. It's a service profile is the server not the hardware blade. So as you'll see when we do things to manage servers we don't manage a blade we manage a service profile and that's an important distinction. Service profiles are required for provisioning. Even if we say, I don't want to worry about, you know, logically created addressing or UUIDs or, you know, firmware policies, I just want to install Windows Server onto that blade as it sits. Well, you still need a service profile. It's going to be a simple one. You're just going to say derive everything from hardware and not derive it from pools, but you're still going to have a service profile. And a service profile is a container. It contains all the configuration and settings about the system. And it gets associated to a blade. A single service profile is associated to a single blade at a time. So if you have 10 blades that you want to do the same way, we'll create a template and then we spawn off 10 profiles from the template. And it's a one-to-one -one mapping. And the cool thing is, is that you can associate a service profile to a blade, install your operating system and your applications, shut it down, disassociate it from the blade and then reassociate it to a completely different blade even in another chassis and even to a different blade model and the system will boot up. You know some minor things like going from half to full, full to half might change your I.O. ports but all those other things contained in the service profile that system will still boot up and most likely run just fine. Well in fact what I see people do is instead of putting like 7x24 4 hour response smart net on a blade they'll put a spare blade somewhere in the environment and then if a blade fails they disassociate service profile, associate it to the spare, bring it up and then they can swap out that defective blade whenever it's convenient. It allows you to do these things. It allows you to do maintenance. If you want to do uh, put memory in, you can put memory in the spare blade, boot it up, test it out, make sure it's good and then when you're ready to cut over you shut down the, the original blade, the one with the application on it you want to upgrade disassociate, reassociate service profile to the spare blade with the additional RAM and boot it up. Makes maintenance a lot easier and it reduces your risk and that's how we get this stateless nature. Now it's not like VMware vMotion. I can't do this on the fly of a running system. It is a shutdown and a reboot but it's a very quick shutdown and reboot to move something to completely new hardware. Think about it. In the past I've upgraded Exchange servers on physical hardware and now I want to move it to a brand new generation server and that's a painful process at times. With this, literally shut it down, disassociate profile, put in the new Gen 3, Gen 4 UCS blade, 
move the profile over and associate it and boot it up and now you're on better hardware with the same installation makes it very very simple and this is like the coolest feature in UCS here is what the service profile contains all this stuff NIC MAC addresses WWNs UIDs pull associations adapter firmware boot orders IPMI settings RAID settings on and on and on and the idea is that it encapsulates this into sort of a logical or kind of a virtual configuration if you understand VMware and virtual machines it's very similar we have this abstraction of the underlying hardware and I show the VM whatever I want to show it with service profiles I abstract a lot of the physical identities and settings of the blade itself and bring up only what I want it to do it allows me to have these standardized configurations that can easily be moved and so this contains more settings than anyone else other blade manufacturers HP for example has something similar to profiles but it doesn't contain nearly as many items and it doesn't make it where you can move blade installations from one to another from one chassis to another and it's much harder to do that with UCS this is an ingrained foundational functionality of UCS it's a requirement so you'll see two opt-in models referred to especially if you're going to be on the DC UCI exam there's what's called the basic opt-in model and this is similar to traditional blade servers in that you use everything off the hardware hardware defaults settings identifiers all that stuff and you move you can move a profile between blades but all those items are going to change so you know we talked in the pools lesson about Mac pools and WWNN and WWPN pools and UUID pools these the basic opt-in model doesn't use those it uses what's on hardware so if I disassociate service profile and associate it to another all that stuff's going to change and you're going to have problems the alternative to that is logical server opt-in this uses those pools for all your identifiers and settings so if I pick up the service profile move it to a new blade all those identifiers go with it and that's what you want to use even if you don't plan to do this start on day one so you're not retrofitting that back in don't use a basic opt-in model use the logical server opt-in model trust me when it comes time to refresh your blades go bigger faster better you're gonna really be glad that you did this so creating service profiles is very easy UCSM provides a wizard that walks you through it and along the way you can make manual decisions on many things or refer to different policies or templates and the cool thing is is that if you don't create these policies or templates up front you can do what I call step out of the wizard and create one and uh, that's why I'm not gonna go real deep into each of these policies and each of these templates I thought about that I thought you know I could do a slide on VNIC template and then one on VHBA one on local disk one on boot etc and I was like no that's exceedingly boring uh, I wouldn't want to sit through that so what we're gonna do in the lab is I'll walk through the service profile creation wizard and we will step out for each of these templates and policies and show you what's required to create a service profile and uh, one suggestion is make sure you have your pools configured before starting so your Mac your UID if you're using fiber channel your WWNN WPNs but again if you haven't done that you can step out and create those pools but usually those are things that require some thought you want to make sure you get your you know your syntax and everything and your naming schemes and all that right so I suggest you do that up front service profile templates are just an easy way to create new service profiles and make sure they're the same the wizard to create a service profile isn't hard but it's kind of a long wizard and there's a lot of ways you could kind of deviate from what you've done in the past so the idea is to create a template and then you can spawn new profiles off of it creating a template is just like creating a service profile except you got a couple of things you set up front mainly what type of template you have an initial template which means if you mod if you create this template and spawn service profiles from it and then you make a change to this template then those changes don't get passed down to the spawned off service profiles you have updating templates where if you make a change it does push down the changes to the spawned service profiles now uh, a lot of times if you make a change it's going to want to reboot the blade early in the life of UCS that bit some people because it didn't warn you and so that was a problem I suggest you create what's called a maintenance policy those that, so that the blades do not reboot on a change without notice and what happens is is that you'll say okay I'm gonna change this updating template and I do it and it's gonna say hey 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 I gotta go reboot 12 of your blades 
And what you're going to say is you're going to set a maintenance policy to say user acknowledgement. That means don't do it until I tell you to do it. And then you'll go in and shut down the OS on the blades, or if it's VMware, you'll put the host in maintenance mode. And then you go one by one and acknowledge the reboot so that the change happens. But it's in an orderly, expected fashion, not just like hit apply and wham, 12 of your blades reboot. So I'll show you that. Maintenance policies are super simple, and it's something you really need to set before we start changing updating templates. Or really, uh, firmwares and things like that, which we'll talk about in a, you know, in a firmware lesson, but they're a good idea. Lab time, so let's create some service profiles. We're going to do a couple things. We're going to use a wizard to create a service profile. Then we'll create the necessary policies as we walk through the profile. I'll explain the purpose and function of each of these policies. We'll associate a profile with a blade and move a profile to another blade. And what I've got in the lab right now, I thought would be a good way to show you this kind of flexible nature is I've got a blade running Citrix Zen server. What I'm going to do is shut it down disassociate that service profile and then associate another one that has a vSphere install and boot that. Now, service profile doesn't contain Zen server and it doesn't contain VMware, but it does point to the boot device and for this we're doing boot from sand, uh, which is kind of a requirement for service profiles. I talked about that in the storage lesson, but it, it deserves to be repeated here that if you're going to move service profiles, I've got to have storage in a place that all blades can access it and that's usually boot from fiber channel or boot from iSCSI. In our case, we're doing boot from fiber channel. So when I move it and install or associate the vSphere service profile, it's going to boot to a different line with ESX installed, and you'll see that. But with that, let's go ahead and we'll jump on over to the lab. All right, so here we are back in the lab again. Just a couple quick things. One way to see which service profile is associated with a blade is to click on the blade. So go to the Equipment tab. Equipment, Chassis, pick your chassis, pick your blade. And over here we see Service Profile, and it gives you the organization, which is root. For us, it's root, Citrix, UCS, uh, Zen Server. My other blade is root, UCS, ESX1. That's already running VMware, so you can quickly see that. If you click that, it'll jump you over and show you some of the service profile configuration. To work with service profiles, that's on the servers tab. So again, this kind of hits home that when we talk about servers in UCS, we're not talking about the physical blades, we're talking about service profiles. So we've got some of those already configured. We've got some templates there, we've got service profiles here, and we've got some things spread out. We use suborg, so prod, which we don't really have, Citrix. VMware, Wintel, things like that for some things that we've already got. That way I can roll an Intel, or I'm sorry, a Windows server onto a blade very easily. But again, if I look at UCS ESX2, that is actually set for unassociated. So this is the one that often runs on the other blade, and right now it's not associated, and that's why it's in blue. That's why this one's in blue. You'll see things like that. So a couple of things. First, let's actually look at how we create one of these. To create a service profile, you pick your organization here. If we're going to do it under root, we'll do that. Right click and create service profile. To do a template, and I'm probably going to do that since that's the same process here in a second, but I just want to show that to you. It's pretty much the same. Now, actually, let me show you this. So right click and you have two options. Create service profile, create service profile expert. First, I'm going to show you the non-expert, the amateur service profile, if you will. And here, it's very simple. It's a one-page service profile creation. So what you can do is you give it a name, whatever you want it to show back there, and then you configure your basic settings. You're not using anything like templates. You're not setting policies. It's very simplified. I don't expect you to use this, uh, to be honest. We always walk through the expert, and I'll show you why that is. But you can do quick and dirty templates right here. So the first thing you set are your VNICs, your virtual NICs. You can only configure two. Why is that? Well, it's the simple configuration. So if you have a VIC card, an M81, you can't slice and dice that up with the basic wizard. But if you have a CNA adapter, MLXQ Logic, this works just fine. And so what you do is you enable, check the box. And you, odds are you want two NICs, so check them both. Put one on Fabric A, one on Fabric B. Give them a name. Usually we do Ethernet 0 and Ethernet 1. You can do Eth0-A or something like that, but 0 and 1 work. For network, 
pick the VLAN that you want it to be to belong to. So like VLAN 17 here and 17 here. And that'll give you a NIC plugged into VLAN 17, one on each fabric. Then we scroll down. If you're using Fiber Channel, you check the boxes for primary and secondary HBA. Give them a name. By default, it's FC0 and FC1. Fabric A, Fabric B. Simple as that. Then as we move down, select your boot device, primary and secondary. So if you want a primary boot from SAN, we can do that. And then you tell it which uh, virtual HBA to use, what the target LUN ID is on your array, and the target WWN. So you'll punch that in. It's real simple to do boot from SAN on UCS. You, you literally tell it which HBA, what the target LUN number is, which we recommend you always set to zero, and the, the worldwide name. And then you have a secondary device. So let's say boot from SAN fails. Maybe you'll do LAN. And often, and then you'll pick a VNIC. So this is a common configuration for us. We'll set up service profiles to do boot from SAN and fall back to network and to do a Pixie boot because we use a tool called Ultimate Deployment Appliance, UDA often for OS deployments, and it does Pixie boot. And so when this thing boots up and we have it installed an OS onto this LUN0 boot LUN, it'll fall to Pixie kick off UDA, kick off a VMware install, which we then installed a LUN0, and so the next time the blade reboots with a service profile, it boots from here. So it's a quick and dirty way to do that. But you can do local disk for disks in the blades, SAN, LAN, virtual CD-ROM, virtual floppy, which I'll show you in a little bit. Just pick and choose. And then down at the bottom, you can say, okay, I want to associate this with a blade. Now there's nothing here because my two blades are both associated right now. If there was a blade that was not associated, it would show up right here and give you information. You could pick it, hit OK, and it's going to associate the blade. You don't have to do that. Notice it's optional. If I type in a name, just some garbage, it lights up my OK button so I can save this, and then I can associate it now or later or next week whenever I want to. Uh, you don't have to do it right now. But that's a simplified service profile configuration, not something I expect you to use often. The next one is the expert, and I'm going to jump in and first show you that. And you see the screen name is, is asking for name, and the first thing it asks you for is your UUID. Where do I derive that from? And I'm going to cancel, and the reason I'm going to cancel is I'm going to do two things at one time. I'm going to create a new template because the process is very much the same. So first thing I do is give it a name, lab demo SPT or template. I suggest you come up with a naming scheme and then dash and some designation of a profile or a template or a policy. Usually it's things like TEMPL or TPL for template, POL for policy, you know, things like that. That's my recommendation. Just a best practice. We have naming standards. That's what we use. Makes it easy to quickly tell what something is. Then the type. Remember I told you about initial and updating where it pushes down changes. So we'll say this is an updating template. And then we just go through the standard wizard where we're back to UUID. So on this blade, when I deploy a service profile, where do I pull that unique identifier from? So we can have hardware default, which means we're just going to use what's on the blade, and it will not be migrated if the service profile is mute, moved. Well, that's, that's no fun. So then we're going to come down and do a pull. We've already got one that we created. We can see here it's 256 UUIDs, 252 free, so I'll take one of those. And then if you want to enter a description, you know, this is a lab demo for the training course. Simple as that. That way you'll know what it is. Good idea to write down kind of a description of what this profile is configured for. So we say next. And then we get into storage configuration. What do you want to do with the local disks? Now, if you're doing boot from SAN, you may not have local disks. In fact, almost all of our implementations have zero local disks installed in the blades. I've got customers at Baltham said, you know what, I don't trust boot from SAN. We did it five years ago and it was a pain. Well, it's not five years ago. And UCS is built on the foundation of boot from SAN. If you want to do mobile service profiles, you got to do it. So we often will, we've had customers buy them and then pull the hard drives out. So you just create a policy or select a policy. By default, there's one called any config. That means any config. Whatever the disk is set for, just leave it. And often that's what we'll do for boot from SAN if there's still disks in the blades. That way we don't touch them, we don't mess with them. But what are my other options? So remember I said, 
if there's no policy that does what you want, we can just create one. So we'll click this to create a local disk policy. And this will be saved, not just used in this template, but I can use it in other templates. So what do you want to call it? You know, demo disk policy. And what do you want to do? So we can do no local storage, which if you know your blades have no disk, just do that. RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5 for some of the, like the full width blades, RAID 6, RAID 10. It's completely up to you. So I'll do no local storage. I'll say we're going to do boot from SAN. If protect configuration is set, the disk config is preserved on disassociation. So on reassociation same server, you may see an error if the new local disk configuration is used. So it all depends. If you want to keep the disk configuration on disassociation, you can leave that checked. really doesn't matter if we're doing no disk. So it's complete. And we can now select it. Easy. Next is SAN connectivity. This is where we create our virtual HBAs, our VHBA. So we've got a couple of quick things. This looks very much like the simple config from a minute ago with some extra options. First, where are we going to pull our node names from? We can do it from the pool. So that's the easy answer right there. Uh, we got one created. We'll just use that one. And then, by default, it's going to create two HBAs, one on A, one on B, and you tell it what vSAN they belong to. So we'll do 11 here and 12 here. Create your vSANs up front. If you haven't done that yet, like we did in the storage lesson, you can create one here on A, one there on B, do a global, whatever you want to do. If you're not going to use Fiber Channel, just say no virtual HBAs, and it just doesn't do it. Then you have to boot from local disk or boot from iSCSI or boot from network via Pixie. Then there's the expert. If you have the VIC cards, your odds are you're going to use the expert configuration. So first we do again do our WWN assignment, which is from our pool that we already created. And down here, we create virtual HBA. So we can create as many as you know the hardware we're going to associate with allows. If it's a VIC card, we can do a bunch. If it's not a VIC card, if it's like a QLogic or Emulex CNA, you're only going to be able to do two. Uh, but you know it all depends on the hardware. So we'll add. And we've got a couple of options here. So first of all, we can do a template. And let's see. So what we can do is we can create a new template, which is going to spell a lot of this stuff out. So what you can do is you can give it a name, Fabric A, or belongs to Fabric B, which vSAN you want it to be a member of, is this template initial or updating, just like we can do with the service profile templates, I can create templates for VHBA and VNIC configuration. That way, if I'm going to do the same virtual HBA configuration on a bunch of different service profiles, I don't have to retype this in or reconfigure it, make sure it's the same every time. It lets me do it over and over again. But you can also, if I update the template, do I want to update all the service profiles that use the template? Again, I'm going to need to set a maintenance policy, which I'll show you how to do. So you can set that as updating. Then there's things like field size, which are some settings. Where do we get our WWN pools from? We've got one for Fabric A and one for Fabric B. Well, that's A, so we'll do that. If you have a QoS policy, you can set that. Again, your pin groups and any threshold policies that you've set. So we'll cancel out of there. So if you've got those configured, you say use SAN connectivity template. And there's ones that we've already created for our lab, and you just pick the one that you did a second ago. If you didn't do this, then you could do the manual configuration. The manual configuration looks a whole lot like the configuration we just used for the template. Again, you're going to do one for at least one for A, and then you'll come back in here and do one for B. So let me show you that. VHBA Fab A. Fabric A will do vSAN 11. No pen group, persistent binding, we'll just leave that as disabled. No thresholds. And down here, we've got a couple of settings. So we do two things. We do adapter policy. And there's already some preset policies here, and I'll show you what those do. So we'll create one if you want one. Give it a name. And really, all this is doing is setting things like transmit queues, receive queues, SCSI IO queues, stuff like that. Uh, these are already set set for major OS's from Cisco. So if we're going to do this as a Linux system, take the default unless you have a reason to change it. In QoS policy, you can create QoS policies again just like I showed you earlier. Like we could do for VMware, we've got that one. For Linux, there's that one. 
If you want to look at them again, you set a policy, you set best effort or what sort of priority you want to set. Maybe you want platinum or gold or silver or bronze. What you can burst up to, what your rate is, and who controls the or host control either none or full. So there's some recommendations for those. But once you set that, we'll hit OK. And I'm showing you a bunch of examples here, so don't think this is going to actually be a working template by the time I get done. So now we have one for A. You're most likely going to want to do another one for B. We move this to Fabric B. VSAN 12, no pin group, disable 248. Set this to Linux and this QoS policy. But again, if you don't want to make these changes every time, use a template, just check the box and use that. And let's see. So in this one, I'll do B and hit OK. And just in case, modify. So you can do hardware default, and if I hit OK on that, I wasn't sure if it would change the derived or not. I guess not. Don't want to do hardware default. You always want to use your resource pools. So there we go. Now, if you want five more, create five more. If you've got a VIC card, it'll apply and run them. If I apply this service profile to a card with CNAs, it's going to air out. It's going to tell me that the blade doesn't have the resources to satisfy my request. But if you've got a VIC, and you really should, unless there's an absolute reason, you can continue doing HBAs. So with that, we'll go next. Networking. So this is going to be very familiar to what we did a second ago. A lot of the config thought and process is the same. Up at the top, we have what's called a dynamic VNIC connection policy. What the heck is that? What this is, and we'll get to this, it has to do with virtualization and hypervisor integration. What it allows us to do is we can take a VIC card, again, an M81KR or a VIC-1280, we can slice and dice up a ton of VNICs, and push those VNICs up to virtual machines. So when the virtual machine sees a NIC and sends data, it goes directly to the Fabric Interconnect to be switched in hardware, bypassing like VMware's v software vSwitch. It's really cool stuff, and I'll show you that in that lesson. But to do that, in the service profile, if you wanted these were going to be VMware, we were going to use this, we would create a dynamic VNIC connection policy. And for such cool stuff, this policy is actually very simple. You give it a name, you tell it, how many VNICs that I'm going to associate per fabric. So this is defaults to 54, which would work fine on a Palo or an M81 card, because I believe that's, again, 56. Once you take out the overhead, I can set an adapter policy, just like we did for VMware. We're going to do VMware pass-through, most likely, and I'll talk about that in that lesson. And we're going to leave this as protected, because this is how you fail over your fabrics. But to use what we call VMFX, or this, this VNIC, dynamic VNIC connections, we'll set this to protected, and that way it does fabric failover should a connection up to the fabric fail. But I'll cancel that for now. But that's just for this VMFX or VMware integration. If you're not doing it, just leave this as its default. Then down here, it's very much like our HBA config. Simple, expert, and no VNIC. So, you know what? I've never seen a service profile installed without network connectivity. I'm sure there's a reason somebody out there wanted to do it. Not me. Uh, but there you can do that. By default, again, it's going to create two NICs, and you'd give it a name and tell it what VLAN to belong to. Expert is just like the virtual HBAs. We can go through and manually create these. So the idea here is we'll do VNIC Fab A. You can do a connectivity template. If you bring that up, it's going to look like just like what we're doing right here, but uh, we just will do it here instead. But you can go next time, save this, and save it as or uh, save it as a template, but create a template and use that every time instead of doing things manually. MAC addresses, I want to pull those from a pool, Fabric A. And again, the reason we have Fabric A and Fabric B pools is I can look at a MAC address and tell you which fabric from UCS it came from. Very good stuff. So then we do, is this going to belong to A or B? I named it A, so I'm going to do A. I'm going to enable failover, so if the link up, from the FEX and the chassis up to the interconnect or all the uplinks from the interconnect to the core switch fail, it'll send down a disconnect message to the chassis and it'll fail this VNIC to B and the host still sees everything is good. Now why didn't I see this checkbox a minute ago in storage? Well I'll talk about, well 
I guess I did talk about that in the storage lesson, but again, with Fiber Channel, you don't do failover. We use multipathing capabilities in the OS, so that's why we don't see it there. Then VLAN config. So we got a couple of options. I can say you're on VLAN 17 native. That means frames coming in and out are not tagged. So if this was Windows installed directly on hardware, that NIC would just be like a like it was on a rack server plugged into a port on a switch on VLAN 17. But what if this is VMware and I want to trunk a bunch of ports? Well, I select a bunch of those. And I can either enable native on one VLAN or do what I normally do, which is trunk or tag everything. But if you select multiple options here, it's going to trunk all those VLANs up through this VNIC. Set your MTU size. So maximum transmit unit. 1500 is the vault for Ethernet. If you're doing jumbo frames for like iSCSI or NFS or something like that, you'll set this to like 9000 or whatever your matching configuration is up level on your switches. Pin group, we've talked about that. If I want to pin things to a certain uplink, I can say pin to fabric A, port channel, or individual link. We looked at that in the network configuration. And then we again have adapter policies. I'll pick VMware QoS policies. And there we go. Network control. We have a network control policy for CDP, so I'll show you that. CDP is Cisco Discovery Protocol. If you've ever been on a Cisco switch and do show CDP neighbors to see what other switches or devices are connected, that's using CDP. It's a layer two protocol, doesn't depend on much else other than a connection and a link light to pass basic information. So we normally create a policy called enable CDP. We enable CDP. That's pretty much usually what all we do and just apply that. That way we enable CDP up to these links. So if this again was VMware, VMware listens and sends or can send CDP information. That way we can process that so we enable it. So we say OK. And it's got my three VLANs, got everything set. Fabric AB, that means that it is starts on A and fails to B. We could also go from B to A, whatever you want to do. But again, I'd normally add a second one and use that configuration. I won't bore you with that again. Oh, iSCSI VNIC. So if you're doing boot from iSCSI, there's some special VNIC configuration that you do here. Name, you do what's called an overlay VNIC. You're basically creating something overlaying a standard VNIC. And then there's some iSCSI adapter policies that you can set. Uh, connections, DHCP information, HBA boot to target if you're going to do boot from iSCSI. Things like that. If you're doing boot from iSCSI, you want another Mac pool. There's a lot of options here to set, or you don't actually have to create another Mac pool. You just choose one out of here. For some reason, I didn't see that. But it, it's fairly simple. Just remember that it's a different configuration than the VNIC configuration for boot from iSCSI. So with that, we hit Next. Placement policy. So this seems a little weird. If you're, you know, if you're walking through here, this placement policies are a relatively new feature in UCSM. The long and short of it is, this becomes important when in two areas. One, if I'm moving from, say, different blade types with different adapters, like full to half or half to full, where one adapter to two adapters, or if I'm using that VNIC connection with VMware, where I'm going to create 60 new NICs. And so what you want to do is, the idea here is to make sure that your set devices, like your HBAs and your hard set VNICs, VNICs come before those dynamic VNICs, so we can set placement. Now, by default, I just say let the system perform placement, but you do have an option. Like, we've created some placement policies here, like B200 to 230 or 250 to 440 for some different things, and what you do is you create this, and then you can just move things around and tell it where you want the slots to assign. So I could say assigned only or exclude dynamic, so dynamic does not get put up front. Um, Basic configurations for dynamic, or I'm sorry, for those VMFX and VMware integrations. Since we're not doing that, I don't need to set that, but it does allow you to set PCI order. So when the system boots up, my devices are always in the same order. Things like VMware really care about PCI order, so that's an important thing to do when you set this. There was also some issues when UCSM2 first hit, you'd upgrade from 1.4 to 2, these things would take effect, 
and go to default and like reorder your PCI devices, which caused a great deal of pain for a lot of people. That's been fixed, thankfully, but that was a problem. So we'll hit next. Server boot order. What do I want to boot from? So we've already got some settings here for like, the, I think Diag comes with the system, utility, utility is a default, but we've got some things here for different options. So we can create a boot policy. So we'll do lab boot policy. Reboot on boot order change. If we change our boot order, do we want to reboot? Uh, enforce naming schemes. Most of those you can leave default. And what you do is you basically tell it how I want to boot. So again, if I want to boot from SAN, I say add SAN boot. Which VHBA? Well, I'm going to do VHBA0. And primary. And I say OK. Well, I've also got other stuff I need to set. So I'll have to set things like, you know, LUN IDs and WWNs, which we'll do. But you can set that. So normally we say try to set your boot LUNs to 0. And then you type in your initiator. So 50 and the rest of that is good. We say OK. You can set up secondaries if you want to do that. Boot up and do secondary, obviously. VHBA1. VHBA and that's going to be secondary. And I want to add another target. So I can add a SAM boot to a secondary and pretty much do the same thing. So primary, secondary gives me two options. And that's how you do SAM boot. So it's just your LUN ID and your target initiator from the storage array and that'll be different on, depending on your storage arrays. You can do LAN boot, which Phoenix do I want to use? Phoenix 0. I can do local boot, local disk. I can do CD-ROM. I'll show you how to do virtual CD-ROM. So you can do any combination and then if you do add iSCSI, you can do iSCSI. And it says which iSCSI VNIC that we saw back there do you want to add? So again, very flexible on boot policy and order. So as I mentioned before, you may do boot from SAN primary and LAN Pixie secondary to do kind of a build process. Or primary from SAN, secondary from CD-ROM, and then do virtual CD-ROM via the KVM that I'll show you and do that. Completely up to you on how you want to do it. So we say OK, and we save that. And then I choose lab boot policy. So there we go, and we go next. Maintenance policy. I've mentioned this a few times, and now we're going to create one. Real simple. Uh, we've already got one here, user acknowledge, but I'll show you how we built that. You give it a name, and you tell it what you want to do. Immediate means if you make a change to this profile, then I get a template update that I push down. Whammo, I'm going to reboot that blade. That is probably not what you want. What you want is user acknowledge. So give it a name. Set it to user acknowledge. Don't do timer because it's just going to say on what schedule. And I don't know anybody who says, okay, it's okay to reboot all my blades at a certain time. So do user acknowledge and a name and hit OK. Ours is called user acknowledge. And we'll do that. Say so next. Server assignment. So you got a couple of options. We can do things like I want to assign a server to that blade over there. Or I can point this template at a pool and have it start carving up and deploying service profiles to all the blades in the pools. Or I can say assign later, which is what I'm going to do. And you can say select power state to be applied when this profile is associated. By default, it's up, meaning as soon as I spawn off a profile from this template and apply it to a server, it's going to go ahead and boot it up. That's normally what we want, but you can change that. Down at the bottom, there's some firmware management BIOS disk controller policies as well. So one is host firmware and management firmware. And this is what we have on our blades. Bottom, what it's doing is, like we have one for 201Q. You say create, and what you can do is go through here and all this stuff and say, look, when I apply this service profile from one blade to another, I want you to lay down a certain configuration. So I'm doing M81KR, which is right here. So I'm going to select that. And when you lay this service profile down, I want you to put 201Q firmware on that M81. And if I disassociate it and move it to another blade that has 201T, I want you to put down 201Q. Because I don't want to worry about if there's a firmware bug that I haven't hit yet. I know this works, and that's what I want. Beauty of a service profile. Nobody else lets you give this flexibility. So you can do all sorts of things. You can do it to the to the RAID controllers, HBAs, onboard controllers, BIOS, anything. The only downside to this is 
is as as we will see in the firmware lesson is that when I try to update firmware using the kind of what I call unified firmware management tool it doesn't let me update firmware on blades because it's going to kick back and say hey Jason well it doesn't say Jason but it says hey you know you've got a firmware policy in place I'm not allowed to override that you need to go change your firmware policy or create one and then change it not do this from here so to me that's an okay thing because you know, changing firmware on a blade that interacts with an OS can, can be a scary proposition. So I suggest you do those. Same for management. We have some things here for like blade management, like if we're putting these on B200M2s, we'll say which version of the code for like the uh, CIMC or what used to be called the baseboard management controller, BMC, it lets us set that. So you actually have two, but I suggest you set those. So we'll say next. And then a bunch of random things. So you can set a BIOS policy. So we'll look at that. BIOS policy lets you set everything in the BIOS. So you know how you boot a server and you'll press delete or F2 or whatever it is for your servers and then you go through page through page and set all kind of crazy different stuff. Well, same thing here. So I'll give it a name. You can do front panel lockout to lock out the front buttons. Resume AC on power, post air, quiet boot. Uh, a couple of good things here. Core multiprocessing. If you're licensed by core and you've got six core CPUs on these blades, but you're only licensed per four, you can change that here and limit that. Hyperthreading, if you need to disable that for some reason, speed step, turbo boost. If you want to make sure VT is enabled, it is by default, but you can do that. Execute disabled bit, you can do that. All sorts of other stuff, and then it gets really hairy on things that I never change. But it allows you to set all that. So yet again, when you apply the service profile to a blade, all those BIOS settings get set for you. So it makes that really simple, and you know it's the same every time. IPMI. IPMI gives you access. It's part of the CIMC, Integrated Management Controller, Chassis Integrated Management Controller. You can set an IPMI profile. I don't have one of these set, so we'll go ahead. And you basically create users' names and passwords, and you can give them admin access. Things you can do with IPMI. If you do VMware, dynamic power management, where I bring up and shut down VMware hosts or blades based on need, you can do that via IPMI. You'll need to set up access and control and all that. You do it right there. Other management tools will use IPMI to do like Wake on LAN, and you just set that up there. Management, if you remember way back when we talked about pools and management IP addresses for KVM, I gave you the option. I said you can either assign IPs to a blade or assign them to a service profile. And so this is where you say none, meaning to the blade, or pooled, meaning to the service profile. In our lab, we've got them assigned to the blade. I'm actually a fan of the service profile. That way I know if I want a KVM into the exchange server, it follows that service profile no matter where it goes. So you can set that there. Monitoring thresholds. Basically threshold policies. We've looked at those before. You can basically set a threshold on about anything and configure those. Power control. UCS has a capability to cap power and do all sorts of things to kind of keep power within a certain range, and you can set power caps. We haven't really talked much about that because it's not what I would consider to be mature and fleshed out, and I've never seen anybody actually implement this. But if you're somewhere, maybe in a colo facility, and say you only get 12 amps of power and you want to make sure you stay within that, there are ways to do power control and power capping. And then scrub policy. So what happens when I disassociate a service profile from a blade with local disk. With scrubbing policy I can say I want to scrub that disk and clean it off. And now I've yet to find out and I need to research more because I, everything I look at says with the newer version of UCSM it scrubs the whole disk. It used to scrub like the first hundred meg. Reason for that was it wasn't meant to destroy data. It was meant to just make the disk appear clean to the next OS that booted up and maybe do an install. So it didn't go, oh, look, there's a partition and a formatted file system already there. It would just go, no, I don't see anything. Do you want me to do a format and an install? Uh, but now it cleans the whole disk. I don't know to what quality level. My guess is it's not like a DOD scrub, but I need to confirm that. But if you want it to clean the disk so it's clean the next time, you say yes. It is going to slow down uh, disassociation, I believe, so just kind of keep that. BIOS settings, if you want to reset all those back, you can do that as well. So we'll hit cancel. That's it for pretty much all of those. So once you're done, we hit finish. And congratulations, you've created the first service profile template. And creating profiles off of this template is very simple. So if we look, lab demo template, 
And what do I want to do? I can either right click and do create profile from template or click that. It's going to say how many of these do you want? There we go. And you can do a naming prefix if you want to. So we'll call these lab demo SP. And how many do you want? Well, I want four of them, please. And off it goes. So there it is. It creates four. It sticks a number on the end of them. They're going to be blue boxed because they are not associated to a service or to a, a server pool or a blade pool. As you go through and associate those, you can then do the install. So there's a lot of of, of things you can do with this. A couple of things. First, we had implementation a while back. Customer bought the basic starter kit, I'll say, of UCS, which is four blades, chassis, the interconnects, all that. But they were going to order another chassis and eight more blades here in just a couple months. So what we did was we created 12 service profiles based off a template. We took the first four, we associated them to servers, did a pixie boot for UDA, installed VMware on them, to the boot line so we do boot from SAN and then when they were happy we shut them down disassociated those four associated the next four did the same thing unassociated those and then did the last four so what happened was is when the new chassis and blades came in the customer you know racked the chassis connected up to the interconnects put the new blades in and they already had the templates the LUNs were set up and configured the OS was installed and all they did was just associate service profiles to those new blades and bam within you know 30 minutes, they're up and running with the rest of their eight systems. So there's a lot of cool things you can do with service profiles and identity pools and all this. Makes it very flexible and very, very powerful. So let me give you a demo of that. Let us take a look. So jump over here. And a couple of things. I want to show you KVM access as well. And this is a great time to do two things at once. So I'm going to look at server one. Server 1 is running Zen Server. That's the profile. So let's take a look. Now, you can do KVM a couple of different ways. Uh, if you use a service profile IP address, we can come over to the service profile and do KVM console. And if I click that, it should kick me back. Let's see if it makes a liar out of me. So that worked. I wasn't sure if we'd have an IP or if it would work since I wasn't sure about the IP to the service profile or to the blade. But, so we click that. The other option is on the actual blade itself, we have a KVM console option. The main UCS manager screen, we have launch KVM manager. So if we click that, it's going to ask me for a username and password. So you can do some things uh, with roles and user accounts to limit people to certain KVMs. And I need to do local or native, say OK. And so we see our two service profiles here and I can launch the KVM from there. This gives me a quick menu for KVM access without actually logging into all of UCS. But in the end you're going to get this same screen right here. So this is Zen Server. Couple of options. But what I want you to see is this is running Zen Server. So let me shut him down. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to disassociate the Zen Server profile off of this guy, off this blade. And then I'm going to associate the ESX profile and we'll watch it boot. And uh, you'll see really what what the benefit of this is. So let me jump back here. It says no signal because we're now at power off stage. Power's down. So I want to go here to the service profile and I want to disassociate service profile. Are you sure you want to do this? Why yes. Yes I do. And we can go over to the finite state machine FSM and look at some things here. It's going to run through a whole bunch of things. We can see overall status back here is configuring because it is removing that service profile. So we can take a look here at some options up here at server. Faults, events, anything like that. Inventory status. But we'll watch this. And what you're going to see happen is the server is going to reboot and some things are going to go to going to go into effect. And the way that service profiles are associated and disassociated is through a Linux boot environment. And what happens is the blade will do a pixie boot uh, to the interconnect using 
reserved VLANs and reserved IP addresses that you never see exposed anywhere else. And it does this, it does a Pixie boot, it loads a Linux environment, if you've ever seen Linux boot it'll look very very familiar. And in the end it does all your firmware updates and changes and BIOS changes and all that stuff happens through this Pixie boot environment. Now you don't really see it, you don't really care about it unless something goes wrong. So it's going to go through here and do a standard post test and all that. Again if you want to watch it you can look at status details here on the blade. We can look at the FSM, the finite state machine, so it's disassociated boot weight. You know, if you just want to sit here and watch a bar go across the screen just to make sure it makes it from one side to the other, the FSM is a good way to do that, but you'll see things like waiting for BIOS post-test. And you'll see this over here as well. Here we go. You can see it loading the Linux boot environment, starting up the kernel, and all that stuff, and then you'll watch it go through the rest of the boot. Unfortunately, using the UCS uh, platform emulator, PE, we can't do fun things like this because, you know, there's really no blade to install or anything. So this is one of those gaps with PE. I'm hoping, like I think I've said before, that it'd be really cool one day to have blades, PVMs, and be able to spin things up and, and do that and really have an emulated environment. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Uh, let's see, none, not, no retry. Are we done? unassociated that means we are done so now this blade is in a soulless state as to say so let's go ahead and associate a service profile so we can do that from here or we can do it from the service profile let's do it from here it says which one do you want to do well let me remember I'm going to do UCS ESX2 oddly enough ESX2 usually belongs to blade 1 ESX1 usually belongs to blade 2 you know consistency it's one of those things if you select available service profiles, it's all ones that are unassociated. If I say all, it's going to ask me if I want to disassociate first. And I don't want to mess with that. So let's go ahead and pick UCS ESX2. We'll say OK. And off it goes. Going back through config, we'll see FSM running amok yet again. And if we jump over to the KVM, we're going to see a process very similar to the one that we just saw, where it runs through the Pixie boot environment, runs, loads Linux, applies the service profile, and then it'll start loading VMware. You'll see it uh, look on the storage array or the storage fabric. You'll see LSI is going to be internal disk. You'll also see it pull back some storage array disks, either did it or he'll do it second when it boots. And I can tell it's our EMC array because they always start DGC, which is Data General Corporation, which is the originator of the Clarion and VNX line. So you still see DGC, DGC in front of a lot of things here. Oh, there it goes doing the Linux preboot, so I guess we're not actually booting from SAN yet. It's a long process. It can take several minutes. Like I said, it's not overly quick. It's, it's fast, but it's not instantaneous as it has to do these things over again. And what we found is that as UCSM uh, matures, this is getting faster. It's, I, I think they're starting to trim things out. You know, well, if I don't need to do these three things because they're already set right, I'm not going to do them, whereas it used to just kind of blanket do everything and now it's loading VMware so what we've done is we disassociated the old profile put on a VMware profile when I did that all the configuration came over MAC addresses WNNs, WPNs, firmware settings all that the boot order my NIC configurations HPAs all that stuff and I didn't show you this on the profiles but we have completely different network configurations for Zen server I think I have four NICs there against VMware where I think we carve up like six NICs or something like that but due to the power of those VIC cards we can just kind of figure this out and do whatever we want to do and that shows you the power of service profiles so with that I think we're done with this lab let's go ahead and jump back to the slide deck I believe we did everything on our list here so that's a good thing uh, we use the wizard to create a profile we actually did a template we created all the policies and went through those explained the purpose we actually disassociated a profile associated a completely different one and showed you how you get that mobility and flexibility so with that I think our lab is complete and the last thing I want to talk about real quickly is installing an operating system so I hit on this a little bit but 
Uh, I've, I've actually seen classes where they go through all the great stuff about UCS deployments, this, that, service profiles, and never actually say, well, how do I install an operating system on this thing? I mean, I got all this great stuff, but what do I do now? Well, an, as you saw, a service profile doesn't really do anything to actually install the OS. It just preps the server and gets the foundation. Then you need to install something. Uh, you can use one to specify, you know, a service profile can specify how to boot SAN, iSCSI network via Pixie. And the usual way you do deployments is like you can use KVM and you can use virtual media that I'll show you in a second and mount a CD-ROM. You can boot from network and do Pixie, which is what we do a lot of times with UDA. vSphere 5 down there, if you look at that, vSphere 5 now look now does what's called auto-deploy and I, what it's called, it's what I call boot from nothing. It does a Pixie boot to a boot server and pulls everything it needs down from like vCenter and kind of builds its image and runs out of memory. But you've got a lot of options. You know, I think most people who are doing large-scale deployments are going to do some sort of a Pixie boot and, you know, run an auto-installer script for Windows or Linux or vSphere or anything like that. But it's really no different than any other server. If you want to do a manual build of that first build, you can absolutely use the KVM and virtual media access. So real quick, let's jump back over into the lab again. I already hit on KVM, but I'll walk you through some of the media, uh, virtual media control. So we're here. Hey, look, our VMware box booted. Nice. Okay, so we're already in KVM. I showed you you can walk, you can get in. Well, you can get into this via the main login screen for UCS. If we click launch, we'll get the same thing that we've already got. Or you can choose KVM from service profile or from a blade. And here on this, this tab right here next to KVM, we have virtual media. If you've ever used virtual media on any other lights out board or any other server, you're, you're not going to see anything here too surprising. Basically, we have client mapping, so if you want to map the CD-ROM of the workstation you're running this from, you can do that, or the floppy drive, you can do that. Or you can add an image, like an ISO image or a disk image here, or you can mount a directory. So I can select a directory and say OK. It says, do you wish to create an image? I'll say yes and then it actually mounts the directory I pointed it at as a floppy image. So if you've got like you downloaded driver files for a Windows, you know, RAID controller for Windows during boot and you just want to mount that as a floppy image and show it to Windows, you can absolutely do that right there. Remove anything else. This shows your mappings here at the bottom and if you want to reset any of the USB devices, front end ports, anything like that, you can hit reset there. I talk about it in the troubleshooting section, but there is a dongle cable that can be plugged into the blades for KVM access. Uh, I believe it also gives you USB port. I think that's right. So you could use that as well. But again, there's nothing here. Just make sure if you mount, say, a CD-ROM that you set the right boot uh, priority and order in the service profile. If you select virtual media, your menu changes. Sometimes I'm like, where'd it go? Oh, yeah, that's right. Single cursor, you can look at statistics if you want to know what your frame rate is, how much bandwidth you're using, what your compression is. Since this is a static dim screen, it's, it's amazing. But you can get that information. Session user list, if you have multiple people logged in watching the KVM, which you can absolutely do. And macros, which are if you want to send over any special key functions that may not work via the KVM or through like a remote desktop, you can do that and you can add your own. Again, there's nothing here that's not in any other good system. You can log everything to a file. Again, nothing here too unusual. So that's that for this. Let's uh, jump back to the slide deck. And that's it. So like four bullets, right? There's not much to that, but that was a really long lab. But I just thought that you would enjoy the lab more than you would enjoy looking at 50 slides talking about service profiles and policies. So hopefully I was right but you should see now how to do service profile. So we talked about what really makes a server a server. It's not just a couple of things. It's a lot of things, and it's things most people don't even consider. You know, if you ever replaced an HBA or a RAID adapter in a server and started having issues and it turned out it had a different firmware or it had different default settings, well, that's why all these other features within service profiles are important. And they bring in other templates like VNIC and VHBA templates, other policies like maintenance policies. They really bring everything together and start deploying servers. Showed you how to create service profiles, service profile templates. Showed you how to associate and disassociate those. And then walked you through how it does it with the Linux Pixie boot environment.
this is really the bread and butter and really what you probably will do and work with most often and routinely with UCS. So it's probably what you're going to be very familiar with. My suggestion are use your templates. When you create them or other templates or policies, pick a good consistent naming standard that tells you what it is and what type it is. So if it's a, you know, if it's a diskless boot policy, put no disk, you know, POL or something like that and just make sure that you understand those things. So be very methodical, plan out your naming ahead of time, plan out how you're going to do this and use templates so it's consistent. But that's it. That's kind of one of the things that really adds the UCS-ness into UCS, if you will. So that's it for this lesson. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.